So meanwhile, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, yeah, I will give a short presentation about um, genetic methods to identify uh, species, a particular marine species. And here you can see a couple of zooplankton organisms, pictures I took on a cruise in the Atlantic Ocean. So you have a huge biodiversity of uh, early life forms in the zooplankton. You have fish larvae, uh, crustaceans, you have eggs of all kinds of organisms, mollusks, whatsoever. And identification is a, is a major problem, uh, especially of early stages, early life history stages. Um, so now we come to the key. Before it was a function of biodiversity, and now it is about how to know how much biodiversity is actually there. And uh, I will talk about DNA barcoding, so using a certain marker gene for identification, and then one method uh, that we developed uh, or we worked on some years ago in the project, so called DNA chips to identify fish species. Um, so, what is DNA barcoding? I assume most of you know, uh, but just in case somebody has not really heard about it. So, we have the genome of an, of an organism. Um, a metazoan, for example, so here the vertical genome. Uh, we have the nuclear genome and then the mitochondrial genome. The nuclear genome is really very large, but the mitochondrial genome is quite small, it's 2,000 base pairs, and it's very well known. And the idea of DNA barcoding is to take a certain marker gene from the neocon, which has a dead day, it's CN1, uh, a small fragment of the mitochondrial genome to agree upon and to set up a database with sequences of morphologically correctly identified organisms. And once you have such a database, you can sequence this marker gene and compare it with the database, and then you can make an identification. Um, so this was initiated uh, 2003 in a publication by Hebert et al., who showed that CO1 could be used as a standard marker. Um, and then in 2005, uh, initiative started to barcode all fish species, which are about 30,000 um, in the barcode of life uh, initiative, the barcode of uh, uh, fish barcode of life. And then the first publication showing that this works for fish was done by Ward et al., working on Australian fish species, showing that C1 is a short fragment of only 650 base pairs and sometimes even shorter is yeah, feasible to identify uh, different fish species. So once you have these database and you have uh, barcodes, so these DNA sequences, you can also use them to design probes for DNA chips um, or DNA microarrays. So what is a DNA microarray? You have a surface, this can, for example, be just a normal glass slide you use for microscopy. This is coated with certain chemicals, and then you can bind short fragments of DNA, usually as long as a primer used in PCR, so something like 25, 30 base pairs. It might go a little bit, a little bit shorter, but yeah, there's something like 20, 25 base pairs, and they are species specific. They bind to this um, DNA barcoding fragment uh, on the chip. And these fragments have been labeled in a PCR process with a fluorescent light. And then with a microarray scanner, you can detect the signal at a certain spot where uh, you have a species specific probe. And then in this PCR product, it is labeled with fluorescent dye, hybridizes, and then you can measure the signal. And then you know there's a mutation um, in the sample. So here you don't need to sequence uh, the sample, you only hybridize it to a DNA microarray, and then you detect the signal to identify the species. Um, that's how a low density microarray looks like. So this is just a, a glass slide used to for microscopy, and these are these tiny little spots, which are the spots with the probes, which can be species specific. So practically you could yeah, put hundreds or on high density microarrays, thousands or millions of spots on this microarray, and each spot can contain different probes or different species. Um, and 
some years ago in an EU project which was called Fish and Chips, we uh, um, developed microarrays to, for the identification of, of fish species. Um, we had a consortium with partners from all European seas to cover the whole distribution range of, of fish species we wanted to study. And then we used also different market views. We used CO1. So actually, as we started with the project, the paper came out, and then we thought, okay, we'll also try this CO1 marker. Initially, we were opting for cyclical leaf because this was the standard marker for fish phylogenetics and identification. And we also used CCMS to check which of these three mitochondrial markers would be better to use. So from several species, up to 75 species in 6CS, 16S, we uh, sequenced um, 16S, cytochrome B, and CO1, and then uh, set up a database. And based on that database, probes were designed to be spotted on the microarray for identification. But first of all, uh, a brief overview about the workflow in these methods. So DNA barcoding. You start with DNA extraction, usually with single specimens, especially when you set up the database and you have your reference organism. You make a PCR amplification, you make a usual Zanger sequencing, and then you put it in the database. And when you then have an unknown sample, you do the same process, you compare it to the database, and then you can identify it. In DNA chips, it works a bit different. You also need, first of all, this database with reference organisms and their sequences. Then you design the probes, you put them on in the array, and when you identify, want to identify specimens, you want to make a DNA extraction, again, of single specimens, but you also take mixed samples. You make a PCR amplification, this is still necessary to attach the breast and dye. And then you hybridize it in the microarray, you scan it, you read out the signal, and then you can see at which spot at which probe the PCR product has hybridized, and then you can identify the species. So first of all, we want to check these three different marker genes from the mitochondrial genome, how well suited they are for a species identification. First of all, here's a 16S neighbor joining tree. So we made a very simple neighbor joining tree. Um, and here you can see the species different fish species um, and such a, um, a this symbol here symbolize that you have many different specimens and if it's very high then you have a lot of genetic variation here we have also many specimens but it's very shallow so we don't have much variation between the species first of all all species nicely separate using 16s except uh, flounder and place they're so closely related 16s cannot differentiate them, so they came together here in one branch of the tree. And then we also have the Gronas, Ivelide, three different species, two different, three different genera, they all cross-segregate together. So for very closely related species, 16S is not working, but for all other, it worked very nicely. And we did the same for cytochrome B, and here it was possible to differentiate all species, so each species and all individuals of one species that cross more nicely here in one branch of this um, tree so we can identify them. And then the same for CO1 and that it was the same result. Um, very nice separation in different branches of the, of the tree. So now based on these sequence data, probes were designed and then these probes were spotted on a microarray, and then we were testing these design probes based on these sequences to see uh, which marker gene gives the best results in these microarray uh, experiments. Uh, yeah, here a brief summary about the barcoding. So CO1 as well as cytochrome B can differentiate very closely related species. Cytochrome B has a larger so-called barcoding gap than CO1. So what is that? In an and you want to identify species, your ideal marker should have no variation within the species, so no intra-specific variation, or at least very, very low, but among different species, different genera, families, 
And so further, you should have a big variation, a big difference. So this is called a barcoding gap, the difference in variation between species and genera. And in cytochrome B, it's even bigger than in CO1. So actually, cytochrome B is a little bit better suited, actually. In contrast, 6CS, as I said, you cannot distinguish close related species, and there's also no barcoding gap. So when you use sequences for species identification of 16S, you run into trouble with close related species. So now we designed the probes based on the DNA sequences and spotted them on a microarray. And here you can see uh, one of these microarrays. The red signals are positive signals. So the green one, uh, sorry, the green ones we want to see to see if the hybridization work at all. So this is just a positive control. The red signals are the ones we want to see. So I put this box around. So we have here two spots with probes for Seta Maxima, the turtle. And then we hybridize a 16S uh, PCR product, which is labeled with the first and dye. We get a positive signal here with the right probes. So we can say in this sample it's Seta Maxima. Here you can see uh, the hybridization with CO1. Here in the box, these are the probes for this species, specific for CO1. But you can see you have a lot of false signals with other species. So CO1 is not really well suited. The PCR product hybridizes also on other probes that actually have not been designed yet. And in cytochrome B, again, here in the box, these are the probes that have been designed for Xeta Maxima. You have the signal here, but you also have some false positives. That's it. So in summary, it turns out if you want to design probes for a microarray, then actually 16S is much better suited because here we have a clear, strong signal and very faint, very few faint false positives. But if you set your threshold a little bit higher, you can filter out the, the false positives. But with the other two marker genes, we got a lot of um, false positives. So in this graph, uh, it's a summary of the arrays or of the probes that, that work. Um, in total, we could find 65 um, probes that work which actually was only 20% of all probes that have been designed. So this study also showed there's a big discrepancy between what you can design in silico in the computer and where you expect that it's species specific, but then you put it on the array, you make the experiment and you see your probe is not species specific. So only 20% could be kept for 31 species. Um, in this graph we have here the target species that have been hybridized here the probes and along this diagonal is basically the match between the target species hybridized and the corresponding probe. So all your signals should be on the diagonal here in this graph. Any signal on this side or that side would be a false positive. So with these 65 probes we got true positive signals but what you also can see is there's a huge variation in signal strength. Some probes give very weak signals others give a very strong signal. And this causes problems if you want to quantify. Because you not only want to know which species is in there, if you have a mixed sample, you also want to know how much. Um, and this makes it difficult, this difference in signal strength. So that would mean you would have to calibrate each single probe with different concentrations of DNA to relate signal strength at the end to DNA concentration, which you might then transform into biomass, but certainly not with multicellular organisms into abundance, but at least a good few steps perhaps to design it. In 16S, 20 probes worked, which were 42% of the designed ones, so here these were the best, of the best marker. In CO1, the barcoding marker, which is now currently in use, only 9% of the designed probes actually worked, and in cytochrome B it was 25%. Um, yeah, here you can see a few species where we uh, successfully could design probes. Um, there are also other methods now uh, that came up in the past years, like next generation sequencing or nanopore sequencing. 
Um, so there are also other avenues that could be tested to see which of these techniques is good to have a high throughput parallel identification in mixed samples. Because if you work all the time with single individuals, it basically is very laborious. You have a clear-cut result usually about the species identification, but I would say the work you have to invest is not much less than you would have to invest if you use classical taxonomy and you look under a microscope species by species or specimen by specimen and make an identification. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.